Today, we, as I said, we're in the second week of a series on Christian basics, starting points, things that we hold dear in the church. And today, we're asking the question, why should we believe in Jesus? Why should we believe he is who he said he is? And why should we take him as the kind of governing authority that guides our lives? And I suppose there are many, many answers that we could start with uh, to answer such a question as why to believe in Jesus. But to guide us, in addition to the scripture, we've been using uh, this book, uh, What I Have Lived By, by Charles Allen. And if you don't know the name, Charles Allen uh, was probably the premier preacher uh, First Methodist Houston has ever had. In fact, today in our church, if the family goes back a generation or two, uh, they remember Charles Allen, even today, listening to his sermons, reading his books, doing, uh, you know, listening or having them, uh, him uh, perform their wedding baptism, still meaningful to people today, even though his ministry is decades past now. But he wrote uh, this spiritual autobiography, and in it he talks about Christian basics, one of which is, why do we believe in Jesus? And he's addressing this question, and this is what he writes. He writes, I believe that Jesus' death on the cross is my doorway to eternal life. His cross is an example of sacrifice, and it is a revelation of God's love, but it is more, much more. That Friday, he did something that forever makes a difference in my relationship with God. For these first disciples, it was a quote-unquote Black Friday. Their leader was crucified. It seemed that God had forsaken his own. But later on, those disciples realized, as St. Paul put it, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. And when people realized that, then they saw the cross, not as, a, a, not as God's desertation of man, but as God's saving power. Then Black Friday became Good Friday. So why do we believe in Jesus? We could say because the Bible told us so, because the church has said so, and I suppose those are, those are reasons to think about who Jesus is or let that be an answer to the question. But like we were talking last week, at least for me personally, the experience of coming to faith is something uh, that uh, has to leap off the page. In other words, we have to live it out. And so the most uh, strong arguments I have found as to why to believe in Jesus, I would put it sort of in this way, and Dr. Charles Allen points towards it. It's that Jesus did something that I think no other human being um, had ever done, and certainly not to the fullest extent, and that Jesus got his priorities right. We love God, we love neighbor. Jesus said all of Scripture hangs on those two commands. So he got his priorities right. He also lived them out perfectly. And when you look at the relationships he had with people, many of whom the world in his day said were not worthy of any kind of relationship at all, Jesus was constantly reaching out to people, all kinds of folks, the last, the least, the lost, so that they might know who he is and experience his power. So when I look at, you know, okay, Jesus, I think got his priorities right, love God, love neighbor. I think he lived them out perfectly. Uh, I also think that God used his life in an extraordinary way, in that ultimately when we get to the cross, okay, and we think of Jesus dying on the cross, God used in a miracle that has changed the world uh, ever since, God used that, uh, that horrible moment, uh, that moment where Christ felt so alone to be a blessing to us all. And he perfectly embodied the kind of sacrifice, the sacrificial living that God calls us to have. So when I combine those three, that to me, I think, is what makes the case. Now, again, this has to be lived out. So I find that, you know, when I think about Jesus having perfect principles, okay, when I think about him living it out perfectly in his life, and when I think about how God used uh, the cross to be a blessing to all of humankind, these are things that I want to incorporate into my life. So when we say things like, I'm a follower of Jesus, or I'm a Christian, or we talk about discipleship in the church, the act of following Christ and imitating him, those are the things I want to do. I want to get my priorities straight. I want to live out my values perfectly. And I pray uh, that God will use whatever sacrifice or offerings I, do, I bring, I offer, uh, to be glorifying not just to God, 
um, but to us all. So it, to me, Jesus is the way we are to live. And because of that, uh, uh, you know, again, his witness, the strength of his witness, I have found that persuasive. The reason we picked our, our scripture passage today is it has perhaps the most famous verse of the New Testament in it. Uh, Martin Luther called John 3.16 the gospel in miniature because it says in one sentence uh, what the whole book, the gospel of John, works to proclaim. And it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And to me, that's Jesus on the cross. That's what he does for us. He offers us a way to live into God's presence. He pays the price for our sins. In him, we have a chance uh, to really live and find the life we were always designed to have. And it was done so out of love. And again, you know, these are all words we use. Uh, these verses are powerful. Many of us, I imagine, uh, could quote John 3.16 from memory. For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only son. But we've got to live these out in a way that's loving and sacrificial, all sorts of things. You know, so uh, one of the things we're also doing this January is we're just taking a look at kind of how we follow Jesus. At First Methodist, we have what's called our first five. These are our five principles by which we try to shape uh, our following of Jesus. And they are these. We worship every seventh day. Uh, we belong to a Sunday school class, Bible study, a small group of some kind. Uh, we serve inside the church and outside the church. Help the church be the church. Help the kingdom grow uh, beyond the walls of the church. We are generous uh, with our time, our talent, and our treasure. And we seek justice so that the kingdom of God does indeed uh, come upon the earth. You know, as we articulate those things, those are sort of the five touch points. And so one of the things we're doing this January is we're talking about the financial, the generous side of life. Because, you know, if you, lo if you look at the life of Jesus, the way he lived, he paid a price. He, he, <laughs> his life cost him. He lived a sacrificial kind of life. One of the things that Dr. Allen lifts up is he talks about Jesus throughout the chapter uh, devoted to him. One of the things he talks about, or he uh, imagines, is the personality of Jesus. I think Jesus was a lot of things. Uh, I think Jesus was a lot, a lot of fun to be around. I think Jesus uh, would have been a great conversation partner or a dinner guest. Uh, I think Jesus uh, would have uh, yeah, been uh, probably also in really good shape. Stone cutter, that's what the Hebrew word uh, we often think of as carpenter. I think he would have been uh, fun. But anyway, I also think he was sacrificial though. And so he would have had a certain humility about him and that he used his ability, which was an incredible gift from God, to really be of service to others. And so one of the ways that we do that in the church today is through what we give financially away. God has blessed us. Now, some will be more than others, some less, but God has blessed us. And even the widow's mite, okay, who would have been a poor, poor woman, uh, you know, in the Gospels that Jesus referenced. And then people who are rich and powerful by b biblical standards, uh, as well as uh, modern standards. Jesus demanded a sacrifice from all. And so I would encourage you, as we think about our financial resources, what do we give that's truly sacrificial? If we're just giving out of our excess, mm, I don't think Jesus is moved by that at all. In fact, if you want to hear words of condemnation from your Lord, that's probably a good thing to do. But our giving should be a sacrifice. And so let's think about what that is. Uh, the church has always lifted up tithing, 10% of what you make. It's real simple in today's world. You get a paycheck, you move the decimal over, and then you've got 10% of what you make and divide that by 12, and you know uh, what you can give every month to be a tither. Uh, Deborah and I, uh, we do that. We did not always tithe, but we set it as a goal. Uh, young in our marriage, we probably gave 2 or 3 or 4% maybe, uh, but we escalated that every year so that even as things like uh, kids happened and came and expenses and education and all these things, we made sure generosity was a part of who we are. But a tithe, I think, is a good sacrifice. 10% if you're giving that away is a good standard. 
But let's think about the number maybe in another way. Because I find when people make a decision to either give or to make a purchase, sometimes there's a number that floats into people's minds. Like, all right, this is what I'm going to give. Or if you've been shopping for a car or house, it's like, this is, this is my budget. But then, and I'm just thinking practically here when I think about my conversations about generosity or things that I've spent money on, there's a stretch number that's also in my mind. Okay, this is what I'm thinking, but if I went the extra mile, then that's what this number would be. I want to encourage you to listen <laughs> for that second stretch number. Why? Well, I'm a preacher. We have to make a budget in the church, and so there's a very practical reason for that. But also it's this, because that number is more likely to be a sacrificial kind of number. One of the things I say to folks when they're thinking about giving financially to the church, I say there should be something that you cannot financially afford to do that's meaningful to you because you're giving so much away. That, to me, begins to put a little bit of a sacrificial spirit in what we do. You know, if, if, uh, if we send money to the church, we send our tithe and offering uh, to support the ministries and things the church does, and there are many, 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 many good things that are going on, First Methodist Houston, that are worth supporting. But it should be done in a sacrificial kind of spirit. And when we live that way, what I find is that our financial sacrifice kind of begins maybe to have a little bit of a spillover effect. And we find ourselves using time sacrificially and talents sacrificially, our financial resources. We sacrifice because what God does, okay, what God does is takes that spirit of sacrifice and blesses it like few other things. You know, if Jesus did not die on the cross and was not raised from the dead, uh, he would be remembered as a prophet, perhaps, uh, a fine teacher of the Jewish law, uh, a rabbi among rabbis. But what really differentiates him and makes Jesus Jesus, if you will, is the cross. And so his sacrifice on the cross, God using that so that we have an open door to eternity through Christ, that to me is the difference maker. It's what makes Jesus, Jesus. And um, that sacrificial spirit is something that needs to also be alive in us. Now, do one more thing here, just full personal confession. Uh, we've talked about having a sacrificial spirit. We've talked about, uh, you know, how Jesus had perfect principles. He lived them out. And then God does this incredible thing through him and his life and his sacrifice on the cross. We've talked about all this. But here's something I think I just need to say, and maybe we can end with this. Even though, uh, you know, especially when it comes to finances, uh, Deborah and I have been able to give more and more away, e even though we have been able to, um, to have generosity be a part of our life. And it's true that, you know, we get paid twice a month and the first check we write or the first money we send is our tithe to our church. And, um, but here's what I have to tell you about the sacrifice. Looking back on it, it wasn't a sacrifice at all. Because uh, what happened as we were able to support things like youth ministry, and children's ministry, missions that we do, these sorts of things, uh, I look back and say, and I know Deborah does as well, that we would not live life any other way. We can't imagine uh, our lives not being fully invested in the church and the blessings and people that we've gotten the chance to know and work with because of financially supporting the church have been among the strongest friendships and most beautiful uh, people and efforts we have ever known. So honestly, as I talk to you about sacrifice, hopefully I mean what I say, but there is a part of me that looking back and having the chance to realize just how wildly blessed uh, I have had the chance to be and Deborah has as well because of the life and ministry of the church, it's not a sacrifice in our eyes at all. So something's changed and that sacrifice, if you will, has a way of being transformed by God's power so that we realize it's something glorious. That's what Jesus, I think, did on the cross. He, of course, suffered unbelievable pain. Uh, his crucifixion, horrible, a terrible and lonely way to die. 
But God took that, took that offering of Christ on the cross and made it something more so that all of us could be blessed. And so what would Jesus say uh, from heaven looking at, down upon us now? I think he'd say, yes, it's what he was called to do. And while um, I can't imagine anyone ever wanting to go through something like that again, I think he's glad that he answered his call. And we should be as well as we answer ours. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We ask that you would be with us and bless us. Help us to see that living a sacrificial life is what you call us to do, and that uh, in, by, by living that way, uh, we have the opportunity through the great work and the power of the Holy Spirit to feel your presence, indeed feeling Jesus with us. So be with us as we seek to live like him. This we pray in his holy name, and we pray together the words Jesus taught us as we say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.